the infinite monkey theorem states that a, a monkey or a pack of monkeys given an infinite amount of time and a typewriter will eventually produce all the works of Shakespeare. It would be nice if we could change this to a uh, full screen mode. That it is in full screen mode. Okay. Um, and so these monkeys, this was, uh, the, the analogy was um, initially conceived as an al analogy for something that is probable, but very, very, very highly unlikely. So if you actually do the math, the, the chances that uh, the, mon the monkeys will produce anything uh, of, of, of reasonable, um, it's, it's going crazy on us. It's, uh, it's, All right. it's, it's moving ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll just talk about the monkeys and we'll figure out the monkey and the computer as we go. And so um, the monkeys te technically are supposed to produce uh, all the works of Shakespeare, but the chances of that happening are, are insanely small. It would not, it, the, the lifetime of, of our known universe would not suffice for uh, that to happen. What are we gonna do? Run it through Google Slides? Is that better? Can everyone uh, see? No. Uh, so you run it on Linux, and the screen um, we tried Linux. juts out the side. You <laughs> run it on Mac OS, and it runs for you. Um, sorry. <laughs> Computers, they never work the way you want them to. <laughs> OK. Maybe now. Yeah, we're back with Shakespeare. OK. Um, and so someone um, in 2003 actually tried to perform this experiment for real. Uh, so they took a typewriter and they put it in, uh, in, in, a, in a monkey cage. And so not only did the monkeys produce nothing but five total pages, largely consisting of the letter S, uh, the lead male began by bashing the keyboard with a stone, and the monkeys continued by urinating and defecating on it. And, and so the, the, the project lead concluded that the monkeys are not random generators, they're more complex than that, you know, they have feelings and whatnot. But the idea is extremely sticky, right? The idea is present in, in pop culture, in literature, if you read uh, Borges, uh, Library of Babel, the, the monkeys, they appear in Simpsons, whatever, it's a trope. The monkey will eventually produce something interesting. Now, we know that in, in reality, a random process is about as dependable as the monkey in the, in the cage, and it's quite probable that it will produce a page of S's. But what if we could harness the monkeys in a way that, that we, uh, take the good randomness and, and apply it in, in a directed fashion so that the monkeys tell us something about the world. So we can use the monkeys for some kind of uh, empirical um, experiment. Uh, and who are we, the people that are harnessing the monkeys? Uh, so my name is Rafał Studnicki. I work at Erlang Solutions as an engineer in the Krakow office. And I'm Simon Zelazny. Um, I used to work with Rafał uh, professionally. Now I work for Walru Labs. We used to do a lot of cool things together on various projects, and, and not working together anymore, we decided to uh, continue collaborating on a hobby project. And so our hobby project is what we're talking about today. It's a non-commercial DIY, you know, punk ethos. Uh, it's just our thing. Uh, and the hobby project is about testing distributed systems and, and how we got to this state of, of, of a hobby project. So first of all, we really love testing. Testing is our, is our main thing. Um, we are classical testing fundamentalists. <laughs> um, we do love TDD. I believe that TDD is what you start with to make sure that, uh, that the APIs you're building make sense in the small and that they make sense in the large, that the, that the system uh, fits well together as a structure. BDD is very important. I don't think Cucumber is important, but BDD, the idea is extremely important uh, that you consider the systems you're building in a human context in the context of the interaction. It might be a, a user interacting with the system, it might be a different system interacting with the system, but you still want to consider th the overarching goal. Um, we're also into loads testing and stress testing. If you were here in this very room um, a year ago, uh, during last year's ElixirConf, um, I did a talk about our shared work on load testing, which you can see on YouTube. Um, so that, that progression drove us into the territory of exploratory testing, where it's not us who built the system are testing the system, but it's us who have a, get a system and try to find out things about it. Uh, so for example, in my everyday work, uh, uh, I'm often asked to, to assess a system in a very limited amount of time. And as a person that uh, doesn't have the full context or the domain knowledge, 
uh, it's, it's very difficult to do that. Um, it, very helpful is to look at tests from the BDD side of things at that time. Uh, but many projects either don't have them or, uh, or they just start on some lower level, so some prior knowledge of the system is already required. And in such a case, implementing that level of tests uh, might be very helpful to, to, um, to learn the system. By that basically helps verifying assumptions and expectations we have from the system because someone told us something, uh, what, what the system is supposed to be doing, or we read something somewhere, and, and doing such tests uh, helps, at least helps me, to learn the system very quickly. And uh, there is an anecdote about a distinguished Polish science uh, physics professor uh, that used to say that theory is when nothing works, but we exactly know why. Uh, on the other hand, practice is where everything works, but we have no idea why. And in his lab, he connected these two concepts. Nothing worked, and he had no idea why. Uh, so we, in, explorat in exploratory testing, we want to also connect these two concepts uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, we want everything to work, and we want to understand exactly why it's working. Uh, so we'll need... Uh, some theoretical background. Uh, so distributed systems theory says that any system can be described as a combination of, uh, of safety and lightness properties, uh, terms introduced by Leslie Lampard in 1977. Uh, so let's start with safety. Uh, informal definition of safety is that certain things never ever happen in, some, in a system. If that things happen, that means the system is not working. Uh, a canonical example of, of a system to demonstrate uh, these properties uh, is usually uh, road junction with the traffic lights. Uh, so a safety, safety property for such a junction could be that no two directions ever get the green light at the same time because that would lead to a crash. And we can satisfy this property uh, very easily by just showing everyone red light all the time. Uh, but obviously it doesn't make much sense. And therefore, we need some other kind of uh, property, namely liveness property. And uh, again, an informal definition of a liveness property is that certain things eventually happen in the system. And going back to our road junction example, uh, that could be that every direction eventually gets a green light, so we can make some progress. Uh, again, in isolation, this property doesn't make much sense because uh, trivially it's satisfied by showing everyone green line at the same time, uh, but in combination with the aforementioned safety property, that makes, uh, well, let's say, a perfect road junction. Enough theory, show <laughs> us the code, please. <laughs> All right, so when thinking, <laughs> thinking about uh, properties, uh, how to check them in a practical sense, uh, we're reminded of property-based testing, obviously, and uh, we thought about using PropCheck, uh, one of the frameworks uh, in Elixir that has already been mentioned on the earlier t previous talk uh, as well here. And um, well, PropCheck, as you might know, is, is uh, used for uh, verifying hypotheses that we might have, generates a lot of input data, and tries to invalidate this hypothesis. Uh, we'll show exactly how we approach prop check testing uh, in a second. Let me just, for the record, show this very simple example of a property basically uh, would generate a lot of stacks of integers and integers, and then uh, we'll test our implementation of a stack. We'll push something to a generated stack, then pop an element from it, and, and we'll see that, um, uh, and we'll want to check that uh, the, st the stack we end up with is the same stack as we started with. So that's, uh, that's what was called uh, a round tree property on uh, Michael's talk. Uh, the other part of the practice, we, we said that we're testing distributed systems. Uh, we're using Docker for that uh, because we think it's very nice and cool for, for that purpose, simply because it can start a cluster on a local machine very quickly as compared to um, physical nodes, virtual machines, and we can start a fresh cluster for every test. That's very important. And our test subject today is going to be Phoenix Framework, 
precisely a part of it, Phoenix Presence. Uh, that's something we, we chose that because that's something we, we used in a large scale. And we loved it. Uh, while using it on a large scale, uh, we've seen some edge cases happening, especially when starting and stopping nodes under, under heavy load. And also, we wanted to learn uh, its internals. So uh, finally, learn CRDTs. Um, and also, uh, we basically set ourselves a challenge. Can we find something interesting before ElixirConf 2018? <coughs> so we're here uh, giving the talk. So uh, you can probably surmise that we, we did find something. Uh, how do we approach this? Uh, you might think, OK, well, they have property-based testing. They started with property-based testing. But the testing fundamentalist in me says, wait, first determine the use cases. <coughs> so let's take a look at our beautiful technical drawing. So the, the, thing on the, the orange thing on the right is a uh, Phoenix, uh, 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 Phoenix Presence application that uses Phoenix Tracker, so our own test app. Uh, that has the following interactions available. Uh, users can connect to a session with a WebSocket. And there is an external endpoint that you can query to get a list of connected sessions. There is also another very uh, important operation, which is a user can disconnect from the cluster. And upon querying the endpoint, we will get a list where the user, uh, user session is, is no longer present. So <coughs> let's, write use, let's write tests for these use cases. Let's make sure we can exercise these use cases. So what we do is we go and write bog standard end-to-end um, -end tests where we make sure that we can assert there's no sessions, uh, get the endpoint for sessions out of one of the nodes, and make sure that there is no sessions returned. Um, we write an another test where we connect the WebSocket uh, to sessions slash one. When we query the endpoint, we want that one session with the ID one to be returned. Fair enough. Our system works. These are the happy path tests, right? We, these are the documenting tests that test what's going on. Um, <clears throat> here we have uh, 100 unique users. When we query the session endpoint, we want the list to contain those and only those users that we just connected. <coughs> So that's all cool, but we want to test distributed systems. So let's talk about cluster behavior. So now we have two uh, clustered applications. Users connect to either one. We query either one of the endpoints, and we expect to get the same list, which means the, 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 uh, the idea is that the uh, nodes share a, a common view of the sessions. And again, we make sure that we can write tests for this and that we have code that exercises this functionality. So we have a cluster.start first class um, thing in our test that we operate on that starts a cluster. We can connect sessions to given nodes. And then we can assert with the combinator um, that is called eventually, that eventually some uh, property or some uh, predicate is satisfied. Eventually just takes that function and runs it repeatedly at uh, intervals you can configure for a period that you can configure and make sure that the values um, eventually match the expectations. So in this case, you connect a, uh, connect a session here, connect a session there, and eventually uh, the list of, of sessions on each of the nodes should contain both sessions. Here we have another test where we stop one node and start it, make sure it gets the list of sessions synchronized again from the first node. And so going through these and, and a couple of more properties, we took a look at, at the system and we tried to determine what the liveness and safety properties of the system are. And we came up with the following. The connected sessions eventually appear on all nodes. This is a liveness property. This means progress. If I open up a WebSocket, I want each of the nodes in the cluster to know that this client is there in the cluster. If we disconnect the session, that disconnect will ca cause the session to eventually disappear on all nodes. Right? So if I'm no longer in the chat system, then I don't want people thinking I'm in the chat system. These two are liveness properties. You can usually tell a liveness property because the word eventually is in there. Uh, and then the following two are safety properties that we won't discuss in depth, uh, but th they are th as follows. Uh, sessions that have never connected don't appear on the list, so we don't create stuff spontaneously. And connected sessions that once appear on a node don't disappear as long as they're connected, so we don't delete stuff spontaneously. So how are we going to do this? If you uh, were here for the previous talk, you will know how we do this. Uh, if you weren't, then I will uh, quickly summarize how we do this. So PropCheck offers a mode of operation called state M for state machine. Um, what we do is we construct a model of our system that's as simple as possible, that is expressed in pure code, that is expressed uh, in our case as a structure with lists on it, list of nodes, list of sessions. And the model is responsible for both generating, uh, for, for, for um, encapsulating 
the uh, events in your system and also for generating the assertions on your system. So in a sense, all the transitions of a model will tell us what the legal histories of the system are. So that's the model. And then we have the real world, which is the cluster that we run in Docker that we've just demonstrated that we can run via our regular tests. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the theory and the practice and run them. And on this, in this table, you can see the correspondence between the model and the real world. So model is the pure model is on the left-hand side, and the real world is on the right-hand side. So for example, uh, our initial model, uh, which is a pure model, uh, is this map on the top. Um, it's, it simply says there are no started nodes, there are no sessions, there are no sub nodes. And in real world, this means we have completely nothing. Uh, then we can start a node, uh, for example, node one. We would add uh, this node ID to the list of started nodes. And in real world, we would start a Docker container uh, in our cluster with node ID one. Uh, in the same vein, uh, if we want to connect a session in the pure model, so again, left hand side, uh, we would add actually a pair node and session ID to the list of session IDs. Uh, and in real world, we would just open a WebSocket uh, on this node, just like we've seen in one of these basic test cases. And what we can do later, uh, we can basically take the left-hand side, right-hand side, and uh, check if they correspond to each other. And using that, we can write our properties uh, that you've seen on some slides before. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, the monkeys that we employed did. Uh, so they came up with a plan to test our system. Uh, first, they picked a random command. Uh, so that's, that's one of these things you have seen before, starting a node, stopping a node, connecting a session. But they weren't that random. They check uh, if a command uh, they pick make any sense. So for example, they don't want to stop a node that's not started, or want to keep um, at least one node in the cluster running at all times. Uh, then execute it. That's the right-hand side of the previous table. Then update the model, the pure model. That's the left-hand side. And then verify properties by taking the left-hand side, checking if it corresponds to the right-hand side. If it uh, corresponds, they'll repeat, try to pick another command, and so on and so on, until uh, they find some, some sequence of commands that doesn't, uh, where, where the left-hand side doesn't correspond to the right-hand side, basically. Uh, that is, that's the monkey's plan. Now monkey do the work. And didn't take them that long to find something interesting in our Phoenix presence application. Uh, so you can see here, uh, that's prop check output. And after 734 tests, something wrong was found. And just below that line, there is a sequence that led to a failure that's truncated because it, wouldn't, it would fit on like 10 pages. Um, so prop check, uh, as mentioned in some previous talk as well, has a very nice feature of shrinking. Uh, it basically tries to remove uh, and shorten some commands and still re that still reproduce and end up with, with a sequence that still reproduces the same failure. And that's exactly what happened here. Uh, now it fits on one screen. That's good. Uh, and in bold, you can see the commands that led to a failure. So that's start cluster, some connecting some sessions, and so on. Uh, but uh, we thought it's not very human readable because there are a lot of Erlang binaries right there, Elixir module, uh, called with a uh, name with Erlang Adams. Uh, so we just translated that to our DSL. Uh, that's a little bit better, a little bit more human readable, but still uh, hard to follow what's going on here. So let me go through it step by step. Uh, so first, we start a cluster. We have three nodes. That's it. Uh, node 1, node 2, and node 3. Uh, then we connect one user to node 1. And then we connect 52 users to node 2. If you remember from the, from the plan slide, uh, after every single command, and here connecting users to node 1 and node 2 is like one command. It's implemented as one command. So after every command executed, we verify the properties. So that's exactly what assert eventually in a function does. What happens here, we check that on all the running nodes, node 1, node 2, and node 3, we have all 53 sessions that we opened. 
Then we stop node free. Uh, if, you, if you remember, we haven't connected anyone to node free. So on the remaining two nodes, node one and node two, we still want to have all 53 initial sessions uh, to be visible. And that's what happened. Then we disconnect all but one user from the second node, so 51 users, and we verify that on remaining node one and node two. We have just two sessions remaining, then we stop node one and verify that on the only remaining node, that's node two, we have just one session, and then we start node three. And we would expect that uh, this session, uh, the only remaining connected session would replicate to node three, but that didn't happen. And at that point, uh, you might be, uh, if, you, if you don't remember what was happening uh, in, the, in, all, in, the, in this whole sequence, don't worry, I also don't remember. And I went through it like 10 times in the past two days. Uh, I totally don't remember. And I think it proves uh, it's very unlikely that a human being and a very thorough tester would came up with this sequence in a test. Especially because if we modify the sequence just slightly, and initially we just connect 51 users to the node 2, it all passes. With 52, it doesn't pass. Uh, so that was a counterexample found, and it, it, it didn't replicate the, node, uh, the session to node 3, so it violated the first uh, property we defined. Eventually, um, eventually, the session didn't appear there. And uh, you might see that we're calling eventually a little bit differently. Here, we're calling it for uh, 60 times every one second. That's what uh, these two arguments mean. Um, after the 60 retries, uh, it still didn't replicate. Uh, you might say it's still not long enough. I once let it run for one day. Uh, I thought it's good approximation of infinity in that use case. And it didn't replicate. And so we thought there might be some issue with that. And the issue with that was apparently the sequence that we don't remember anymore, led to some internal Phoenix present state merges and, and uh, uh, optimizations uh, so that there was one incorrect delta stored somewhere so that uh, when node three called node one to update the state when it uh, started, it was consistently getting this, this incorrect delta and uh, basically never made progress. And we actually fixed that. It took us uh, a long time because uh, that's us fixing that. We had totally no idea what's going on in Phoenix Presence initially. So uh, the counterexample was found like in May, to late May, and it was fixed like uh, in August. Uh, the whole, the whole, this whole time, uh, what took this whole time was figuring out what's happening in Phoenix Presence, but. That was one of the things that was our goal, to, to learn the internals. So that was achieved, actually, and the next cases were fixed much quicker. Okay, I already told there were more cases. <laughs> yes, there were more cases. Um, so, so we said we're going to test distributed systems, but all we're doing now is starting and stopping nodes. That's not really fun. So let's get to the distributed system. So we, we're going to extend our model uh, with uh, two important primitives. We want to take the network and create net splits in the network. So as you can see here, we're going to start, I'm going to be the old TDD guy, we're going to start with a test, we're going to create a cluster, and we are going to run a thing called cluster.split, which will split the networking and, and uh, cut off the nodes from, from seeing one another. And this test shows that eventually after the split, the node lists are, will diverge, and each node will have a different view of the system. Right. So we will uh, um, have availability but not consistency. Uh, and this is where Docker really shines, because there's a Docker uh, IP tables image that you can run as a privileged container, and you can do whatever you want with IP tables on your host machine, which means you can run these fancy tests without sudo. It also means you can do very malicious things to whoever's running the script. So watch out. Uh, but it is possible. I think it's a security hole. Um, but it's very, very useful. So we did that. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, cluster dot split actually calls this bash script underneath which hashes the nodes so they're always in the same, always the, the, a given pair of nodes always hashes to the same uh, chain name and we block all TCP traffic between the nodes. 
So our updated model now contains not only a list of started, stopped nodes, sessions, but also contains a list of splits, so pairs of nodes that can't communicate. And we have these three new op operations, uh, create a net split, heal a net split, and take a cluster, uh, node local view of the sessions. If you remember previously, we treated the sessions as a big monolith because that was the model. The cluster should always maintain the same view. Now we explicitly say that we allow for the cluster views to diverge because we're going to use that to, uh, to look at more interesting things. And on the right-hand side, the real-world cluster also knows how to split the nodes, join the nodes, and get the session IDs from a particular node. Uh, so the cluster properties are updated again, that the sessions uh, eventually um, replicate on all directly reachable nodes. The disconnects also propagate only across directly reachable nodes. And so, again, we, we just modified the, 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 the model code. We knew that the real-world code works because we had tests for that, and we let the monkeys do their job. And again, it didn't take them too long to find something interesting. So again, let's go through another uh, example. Again, we have cluster of three nodes, the same three nodes. Uh, and we create a split between node one and node three initially. And then just for the record, uh, because it happens after every command executed, we must check that uh, the state is consistent on all the three nodes. In this case, we haven't connected any th anyone yet, so it's an empty list everywhere. Then we connect three users to node three. And uh, you, here in this eventual assertion, uh, you can see our new updated property in action because we verify that these three sessions only appear on node two and node three. They don't appear on node one because uh, there is a split between node one and node three. That was fine. Then we disconnect first user from the node three. We verify that this is reflected on nodes two and node three. We do the same for second user. Uh, we make sure that the only remaining user is there for node two on node two and node three. And then we heal the split. And we would expect that this one remaining session will actually appear on node one. But that wasn't the case. Um, so uh, actually, all of three sessions appeared on node one uh, here. Uh, so that, vi that violated the second, uh, second property, that all disconnected sessions eventually disappear from the nodes. And that's what happened. And the underlying issue here was, was actually very interesting because it, it seemed that when we have a net split, so even though there is a net split between node one and node three, joins or connections can propagate between node 3 and node 1 via node 2. And internally, it stores them. When we ask the API, they don't appear because they're filtered out. Uh, and, but, but when this user disconnected, that information was not propagated. So actually, uh, internally on node 1, these user stood the sessions were there forever. They were never removed because that information was not propagated it all happened during the net split. And we thought we fixed that. Uh, we were happy. I actually went on vacation. But after two days, I got a call from the boss, Monkey. Uh, and it said it's not quite fixed, because it, it, it actually fixed the issue on a cluster of three nodes. But when, we, when it, they tried five and seven nodes, it wasn't that good. Uh, luckily, uh, I think we already fixed that. There's a pull request coming up in the next few days. <laughs> uh, it works on uh, seven nodes now. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the story. There, there were several more issues found um, that are that we all. Well, they're all uh, part of uh, c PRs open uh, to the Phoenix project. We hope to uh, improve the project that way. Um, I guess this story showcases some good sides and some bad sides of this approach. Uh, so I, I, I hope we made the case for the good sides. We were able to take a model and generate both tests and assertions and verify that they hold in the real world. I think that's a big win. There were obviously problems. Um, one of them is that the last test run after the boss monkey called took uh, one, 132,490 Seven seconds, 79 seconds, and that is uh, roughly 36 hours. Right. So you won't, you're not going to be running this on every commit, right? Um, the, the tests don't prove anything, and this is important because people like to say, "Oh, we've proven this and that." They just provide more data in support of a hypothesis, or more precisely, they help you disprove some hypotheses, but they will not help you prove anything by constructive proof. Um, that's that requires different tools, and that's not that's not possible with uh, with QuickCheck. Um, there are timing problems and non-determinism problems. The, the higher up you test, for example, if you're unit testing, 
uh, you know, a, a regular uh, module functions, then this doesn't happen. But if you're testing a cluster of real stuff running in the real world, you're going to run into timing issues and non-determinism. For example, you might get a trace of a sequence of events that triggers a bug sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't trigger a bug. So you're going to have to remember that sequence and try to run it repeatedly, or like run stuff in bash loops. It, the, the UI sometimes is, is suboptimal. Um, shrinking versus embellishing counterexamples is another thing that you might run across. Prop check and the quick check family of tools want to show you the smallest possible example that replicates the issue. Sometimes, by shrinking the examples, they trigger the timing issues or the other interleaving issues that make it harder to replicate with the smaller examples. So you want to take what QuickCheck found and add to the data, put more sessions in place, do something extra so that the computer has, has more work to do and the bug gets triggered. QuickCheck will not, or proper, proper PropCheck, they will not do this for you. You have to use your intuition to do this. Um, interesting cases involve a lot of data. As you can see, the, the test runs get longer and longer. There's a lot of stuff that seems redundant. Why are you turning it off and on? What's, what's up with that, right? You have to account for that. There's going to be pages and pages of data that you might need scripts to, 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 to wrangle it and to get it into a human readable form or human executable form. Um, there is no concurrency, at least in, in the approach that we used. It was hard to capture the fact that, for example, we want two nodes to go down at the same time or we want two nodes to go up at the same time. Um, the, the, state, the state M model in PropCheck specifically says one step happens right after another. Um, we're looking into that. We're thinking how to do this. Maybe we can have a combinator that generates a step that contains other steps and try to run that in, in, or update the model as if those were concurrent steps. But this is still an ongoing thing. And most important of all, you still need regular testing. You, can't, you cannot jump straight to property testing. Uh, because that's just going to be super messy. Uh, there, it's going to be hard for you yourself to make sense of, of what's, what you've done. Um, so please stick to the normal testing. There are specific cases where, where property-based testing really pays off, um, as, as has been the concern um, throughout, uh, I guess, uh, today's portion of, of the conference. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a silver bullet. And sometimes, and I guess this, this might trigger some people. If your model is very complex, you might want to test the model, which is testing tests, which, which sounds smelly. But if, if, if the system is complex and the model is complex, you want to trust that the model makes sense internally. So the pure side of the, the left side of the code sometimes needs extra love. Uh, as it usually happens with property-based tests, they often find some issues in underlying software, uh, libraries, and even hardware sometimes. It was no different here. Uh, so for example, by default, Erlang VM uh, sends uh, tries to connect to a node when we send a message uh, to it. And in our case, it was our configuration problem. Uh, it just caused the tracker process to hang for a long time and caused a lot of failures. Uh, the other one we found, uh, when connecting uh, users to the Docker containers via port forwarding, uh, we hit some limits, especially on Mac OS. It, apparently, there's a hard limit on uh, connections you can open. That way, and even then on Linux, uh, there were some timing issues with releasing these ports, so we just stuck to not using port forwarding, just connecting to containers directly. Uh, so the whole story is in the code and the repo. That was just uh, a part of it, basically, uh, and also in Phoenix pops up pull requests. Uh, yes, so that's all what we had for you today. Thanks so much for coming, and uh, we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, before we take some questions, before we take some questions, if you want uh, the company I worked at, <laughs> Erlang Solutions, to take a look at uh, architecture of your Elixir system in a free five or ten day um, workshop, just go visit our stand upstairs, talk to Claudio or Adam. And also this year, just to remind you, we're celebrating 20th anniversary of open sourcing Erlang, and um, uh, if you want to join the celebration through parties, uh, meetups, and so on. Uh, just uh, follow hashtag Open Erlang. And if you're interested in the company I work for, uh, Waller Labs and uh, high performance stream processing, uh, follow this character or talk to me. And that is really it. Uh, those are the image credits. Uh, thank you very much. No monkeys were harmed in the making of the presentation. Uh, questions? Uh, can I see again the URL of the GitHub project? Yes.
Distributed owls breaking PP. There's, <laughs> there's only two repos in distributed owls, breaking PP and PP, which is Phoenix pumps up. So thanks for a great presentation. And um, just curious, did Phoenix already have any property tests? And if not, did you PR property tests into Phoenix? Um, I don't know about property-based unit tests. I, here's the thing with these kind of projects. They're very heavyweight. It would be, it, I, I don't think it's a, I think it's, 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 it's an organizational decision to pull this level of testing into a repo. Again, this is not something that you will run on, on your uh, CI server. If I were the maintainer, I would probably not want these tests in the Phoenix repo. This is like an extra thing. This is an experiment. This is a monkey-based experiment. Um, so yeah, I just want to add that obviously all the, uh, so we had, f I think, four counter examples fixed. Uh, all of, when they were fixed, they were obviously covered by the unit tests and integration tests inside Phoenix PubSub that reproduce the same issue, but on the lower level. Uh, Great. Hi, yeah, thank you for the talk. That was really informative. Uh, super fun to see how you went through um, how to property test a cluster like that. I'm, I'm curious with regards to like um, generating values, if you thought about generating clusters. So like say a list of n clusters where it's you know one or more, or, you know, some sort of like a generative function that would give you those clusters. So then you could have caught the five or seven case or end case scenario? Uh, so for now, it's hard coded. It needs to be upfront. We need to know how large the cluster is. Uh, we were thinking about that. Uh, th for example, we would always, uh, a possible way would be that we always start with a cluster of three nodes or five nodes, and then we have a command. There is a possible command that adds a node to a cluster or end nodes to a cluster. Uh, but uh, yeah, for now, it's just, just hard coded. Cool. Yeah. And, and the cost of all those operations is time, yeah. right? So the more, uh, the more involved your testing becomes, the, the bigger the space to search. And remember that we're r testing the model against real-world Docker stuff that needs to get started up and, and stopped. So that's, that's the cost. Cool. I think that was a fantastic talk. Uh, my question is, so this happened over the course of months, many months, or this year? Uh, did you have any property-based testing or any experience doing property-based testing prior to that? Or was this kind of your first adventure into both property-based testing and Phoenix presence? No, it is not our first ven venture into either of those things. We've had production experience with Phoenix presence and with property-based testing. Uh, this was like kind of what we can do for to have a good time and to have something to show <laughs> to the community. Cool, thanks. Okay, we, we don't have more time for questions. Yep. So for more questions, you can go turn yep. them outside. Okay, thank you.